Greetings. My name is Stan Forzik. I'm a retired uh, executive from Amtrak. Uh, I've also had uh, different other gigs throughout my career, uh, working on both uh, infrastructure and uh, energy. And I'm a member of the Coalition for National Infrastructure Bank. And we have been out there in the bushes for the last two years, trying to develop uh, uh, legislation for a fifth national infrastructure bank. Today, I wanna to talk about rail and rail projects uh, because we all know the United States doesn't have high-speed rail uh, and it's only got commuter rail in certain locations, but I wanna just talk about the history of rail in this country. The United States started rail transportation two centuries ago, that's two hundred years, all right? Most of the traffic in the very beginning was done on the eastern portion of the United States and went north to south. Uh, by the time 1869 rolled around, we had developed or designed, developed, and implemented a transcontinental railroad. And the reason for a transcontinental railroad is because it was taking people at least two to two and a half months by wagon train to get to the West Coast from Chicago or St. Louis. Now, uh, with the uh, Transcontinental, Ra Transcontinental Railroad, it was gonna be done within a week. So everything revolves around getting faster, getting certain amount of movement, all right? After the Transcontinental Railroad, now we had railroads going north, south, east, and west. And we started on the approach of technological improvements for train service or rail service. Those are very simple. They're coal, they're oil, research and development, and electricity. Subway systems began about 1900. They started in Boston, went to New York, and throughout the United States. And they were electrified, mainly using DC power. In 1903 through, 19, through 1931, testing began at several different portions of the United States, some in Louisiana, some in Cincinnati, some in, uh, in um, St. Louis, to develop uh, wind tunnels, create uh, uh, a design whereby trains could go faster because people wanted to move. In the 1920s through the 1960s, the rail, rail passenger service was in its heyday. The Pennsylvania Railroad became the number one railroad in the world, approaching speeds for moving commuters and passengers around the United States at over 125 miles an hour. And that, through the FRA rules, is what high-speed rail is. So they were in their heyday. World War II created many problems. It created a problem for the other countries in the world because they were decimated through the bombing. In this country, we retooled all of our manufacturing, we developed refineries, and we started storing oil. And the oil was used to win the war, and so were other, other manufactured items. What happened was, when the war ended, people came home from the war created a sense of independence throughout. If you remember the song, uh, How Are You Gonna Keep Them Down on the Farm After They've Seen Paris? That was a song after World War II. And it, it's correct. People wanted independence. They wanted to move back and forth. In the 1950s, President Eisenhower developed a highway bill to develop all the interstate highways across the United States. Notice I didn't say there was any money going to railroads. So we created highways. So since the 1950s, early 1960s, no money was being allocated for railroads or rail passenger service. In 1965, President Johnson uh, actually signed the High Speed Ground Act of, uh, for creating high speed rail across the country. And the first thing that was done was the Penn Central Railroad developed metro liners between New York and Washington, D.C. that actually ran at 125 miles an hour. 
that was inherited by Amtrak. And Amtrak continued to run that until the early, uh, uh, until the early 2000s when all of the Acela trains came into being. But that is the last act that was created to actually put in high-speed rail. What we have in this country is interurbanal service, meaning that you can't really go high-speed rail because you've got to make a stop within 20 miles or 25 miles. And it works out well because the Northeast Corridor works together with commuter agencies and you can run commuter and a cell of high-speed rail at the exact same time. The coalition has looked at high-speed rail in various conditions, one being one straight line between East Coast and West Coast, North to South. The other, was, uh, the other one is a configuration of different corridors that could meet up and, and, and uh, put in high-speed rail going uh, West to East. But high-speed rail in this country is not going to work until we get the money, A, and B, we stop the regulation. Because although the Northeast Corridor and other systems can go 165 to 200 miles an hour, the FRA regulates at what point they can start and what point they can stop. So the money will create the equipment, will create a certain amount of design, but we're never going to be able to do anything unless there's a reform of the regulations to run high-speed rail. I urge people to go out and look at what I'm talking about and also consider signing on to become a member of the coalition so that we can move this forward. Thank you.